Associate Professor Gillian Kidman. So today we'll be presenting the who of CIRAC and I was lucky um, enough to, you know, with the, my fellow pre-service teachers and can I just get a show of hands um, how many people in this room are teachers? Be interesting. Oh, cool, welcome. We'll have a chat later. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I was lucky to be involved um, with the project with my fellow pre-service teachers um, just in the past six months uh, working with CIREC um, in partnership with um, Melbourne Museum and ScienceWorks. And uh, yeah, and I'll just, we've gone through um, the presenters that you can see on screen. Um, other speakers that you'll also see in appearance, uh, who's making an appearance on the videos will be May. And she is one of the lead educators at um, ScienceWorks. And we also have um, Jonathan Shearer, who is the manager of Sci ScienceWorks, where um, Sci uh, CIRAC, which is uh, the first programmable digital computer um, built and designed in Australia, uh, will be featuring today. Um, and yeah, it's amazing because it's the only one that's left intact of the first generation computers. And I'll get our um, lecturers um, to talk about that more as we go through. So um, I'll play the first video here that Roland's provided for you. Did you want to say a few words before we continue? Roland? No, that's, good. that's good. Let it roll. Okay, let Excellent. it roll. My name is Roland. I'm from uh, Melbourne University Faculty of Education. I'm here with some friends and we're in Spotswood, Melbourne. Mm. And what do we have here at ScienceWorks? So we're at uh, ScienceWorks Museum, which is the permanent home of CIRAC, Australia's first programmable computer. Did, hang on, did you say first programmable computer? First programmable computer in Australia, and in fact, fourth in the world. Well, let's just wind that story back, starting from today. I want to place the context of where we are today. We've got computers in 2020, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, machine learning, mixed realities, deep fakes, and augmented automated surveillance software. But let's wind back a bit further from today, because before that we had mobile computing. We had smartphones, we've got mobile learning, personal computing, social media, pervasive internet, digital disruption. But let's wind back a little bit further, because there was a time when we just had desktop computers. And this was when the internet and bulletin boards were making their encroachment. We had software being freedom and shared. We had Creative Commons. We even had the birth of Linux and operating systems. Let's wind back a little bit further, because there was a time when we had room-sized computers. And this was a fantasy world when science fiction was envisioning all computers would fill rooms. We had um, Sid, the computer from Jerry Anderson's UFO. We had Hal, the computer from 2001, A Space Odyssey, and Colossus, and many other things. But these were anchored in the image of real computers. We had NASA, which had the Apollo mission computers. Now, if you think about the Apollo mission computer, we had the um, one that was used by Neil Armstrong that landed, uh, helped him to land on the moon and the error message had appeared on it. These things didn't just happen. They happened because there were people that were actually bench testing them. And in fact, whilst these computers were coming up with results, we had people who were actually checking with slide rulers and paper calculations in the background. Because that is the real message of computers. Because computers are people. And in fact, in Australia, we had a series of human computers that were helping drive this technology and helping chart the way. Well, that's interesting history. And Roland, would you uh, care to share what the video is all about? Thank you. It's really important to place it in the context of where we locate it. And the problem with uh, sometimes when we're managing these computers is we tend to think of them in terms of just the gadget or the tech. So if you notice the way I ran that narrative backwards, I took a journey which was actually leading us through the technology changes, but we're going to begin to wind it forward later in this presentation and then begin to ask some questions about the cultural context that was actually steering CIRAC in its early stage and what relationship that has to the way that we do things today. Well, then could you so just um, speak a little bit louder, please? Yeah. So is that better? Um, now, look yeah, yeah. Just speak a little bit louder. Okay. So we have here the computers that actually 
form what we're doing today. We had the, and if you move on to the next slide. So in this context, I was talking about the things that we're doing with the technology. And we now are looking at machines that are actually learning, listening, thinking, and remashing. So it's a really exciting time. And in some ways, this is the future that we dreamed of 20 years ago. Then we move a little bit earlier. And this is a very personal computing, which is pervasive. And it tends to be something that we've got in our pockets, in our lives, with all of the issues of digital disruption and about people now being media producers coming to the fore. And then we wind back a generation to the desktop computing. Now, I kind of cheated at this picture. Does anybody recognize the picture in the audience? Okay, I cheated at this one. I liked it because it's got the, the modem at the top there, um, which is the, you know, the early introduction of bulletin boards, which gave us the gateway to the internet. Um, I cheated because he's actually looking at a mainframe called Whopper from the film War Games from 1983. I remember when I had an Apple II computer and I brought it to a Rotary Club and those Rotarians freaked out when I dialed into an online bank to show them that the things they could do with online banking in the early 1980s. But it's also a time with the desktop computing when you could begin to build an operating system. And for this conference, it was the uh, Creative Commons, Software Freedom, and the birth of Linux. Now, moving on to the next slide. Now, I've had to really pick this up for some fantasy computers. It's really hard to get photographs of big old computers, you know, apart from CIRAC. I mean, so some of the best illustrations, you look at what we have in our fantasy. This is the science fiction's notion of what the future of computing would look like. It'd fill a room or a spaceship like PAL, or it'd be looking for aliens, which was Sid from Gary Anderson's UFO TV series. Has anybody heard of that one before in the audience? <laughs> oh, that's making me very sad looking at your sad face there. No one. Oh, well. Uh, memory Alpha from Star Trek might be something people have heard about before. Any hands for that? And lastly, Colossus from the Forbin Project. Does anybody remember the name of the computer that Colossus teamed up with that actually took over the world? No, okay, that was called Guardian. See, you've really got to get brushed up on your science fiction here. Um, those <laughs> pictures actually often didn't show smaller computers and more pervasive ones, they just became smarter. So. Um, there's a few things that have, we've done to actually shrink and miniaturize that and personalize it. So let's have a look at, um, if we move on to the next slide. This is from that era, the NASA Apollo mission computer. Um, we've got the display keyboard computer from the Apollo lunar lander, and that used what was called rope memory. Has anyone heard of rope memory before? Okay, some new ground. Oh, good, good to see. Thank you. Some people have heard it. Great. And they actually handed out uh, four Congressional Medals of Honor. Um, I believe three went to the Apollo 11 um, crew. That's Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Ed, who flew in the uh, command module. But there was a fourth one that was handed out. Does anyone know who got the fourth medal? Fourth, fourth member? That's right. There, there was a fourth member of the team. He wasn't in the spaceship. He was actually on the ground. Any show of hands? I guess it's uh, was it Margaret Hamilton, Roland? No, actually, it wasn't Margaret. Uh, it was actually someone else. It's a bloke, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> That's why they were hidden figures. But it just goes to show he was the one who actually did the coding and uh, identified the computer error and was pivotal to the success of the mission. Um, because of his ability to recognize something that with his thorough testing, that he was able to say it was an overload problem, but the computer was still good for go for a landing. Now, I bring this picture up here before we move to Hazel's talk, because I'm connecting here that they had to check their answers with a slide rule. Now, you might think it's quaint, but if your life actually depends on a machine and you're going to have to do these calculations, you want to be damn confident of it. And so you'd bench test it on paper. In fact, that was the part of the role of the hidden figures. When Apollo 13 had to reorbit, calculate its orbit, 
they actually had one of the ladies, it's Margaret Hamilton, who actually did the calculations by hand to confirm that the computer was right. And so I'll now pass on to Hazel, who will explain a bit about the human computer through the slide that we've got here. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, before we play, are you going to play the video? No. Before yeah, go ahead. play the video, maybe I can just ask the audience, uh, do you know what this uh, CIREC uh, stands for? Because that's the topic of our presentation, right? <clears throat> Anybody would like to venture a guess about the, so um, was the, was the acronym? CSIRO what does CIREC the stands for? What is the CS? So we've got um, someone offering a, an answer here. So, yep. so CSIR was the organisation that's now CSIRO and AC. Okay. CSIR is now the yep. CSIRO, that organisation, and AC is Analog Computer, is that right? AC is Analog Computer, Hazel. Ah. Is that right? Okay. <laughs> uh, getting close. Getting close. To, yeah, so instead of, uh, so the C is computer, but what is A? AC. Automated? So People are ask, answering automated. Is it automated, Hazel? Automated, yeah, automatic. Automatic. So it's automatic computer. So the idea, of course, the C, CSIRO is the Commonwealth Scientific um, and Industrial Research Organization. So the automatic computer starts because um, originally, the idea of computers is actually a human being doing the computing, doing the compute, you know, the computer. So the automatic computer is, you know, trying to make, make, make that computation automatic using some electronics. So, um, so with that, you know, I'll start with the, uh, the video then. You can, uh, you can play the video. Yeah. Um, so this is Hazel Tan from Monash University. So uh, just now Roland mentioned about women computers. So in the past, computers actually is the term meant for people who actually, you know, compute uh, data and information. So, um, and this was a role actually occupied by a lot of women. So, um, and we know about women computers actually made, best made publicly known through the movie Hidden Figures, where you see the African um, American women ca calculating um, for you know information data for to launch uh, the men to the moon. So, uh, women actually are data processors uh, in the scientific environment. You know, where and they are it's actually a very skilled and demanding role. So, in, in Australia, for example, in the um, uh, 1800s, right, uh, Australia actually embarked on a huge uh, international project on um, in charting and mapping the, the, the sky, the stars in the sky. So, a lot of women actually employed during that time to look at the star map you know, the photographs of the stars and do the calculations to create the star map. So that was in the past. With regards to the CIREC project, uh, Kay Thorne was the uh, woman involved in, in the project together with uh, three other men. So um, she started working on the CIREC in the computer lab in the Melbourne uh, Physics uh, School in the 1859. So what she did was she applied for a technical assistance role um, in a, on a recommendation of actually her friend in school, Peter Thorne, which later, you know, they got married and she's Kay Thorne. So, um, well, what they did was, you know, in, in what she said was that they, they worked together as a team, you know, um, which shared the successes and the failures or the disasters. So if they look something, everybody will look for it. Um, and if the machine is not working, they will try and troubleshoot and find some ways to you know, work and solve the problems. So back then, they had uh, something called a, a Frank's valve tester, which actually um, is actually a stick, uh, a rubber tube on a stick. And what they did was they start up the program uh, and then if they have any problems, uh, they started the programs and then, you know, they will put the stick on each of the vacuum tubes, which is the valves. And, uh, and if this program stopped at the time, then they'll know, oh, maybe this is the valve that is not working. So in that way, they try to troubleshoot the problems together. Okay. All right. 
So coming back to the, um, you know, to the video. So uh, is, is it clear or is the sound a bit muffled? Because it, it seems a bit muffled uh, from, my, from my side. No, we, we can hear the videos very clearly. Um, oh. you're, you're also very clear. Maybe Roland will just need to speak up a little bit clearer. I mean, um, okay. sorry, louder. Yep. But yep. you're fine, Hazel. Keep going. OK. So, uh, so for my segment, I'm actually sort of highlighting a bit about the role of women. Because I think, um, you know, in terms of like the current state of um, uh, the context, you know, you can see that there are actually very few uh, women in you know, in the IT sort of industry. Um, and also very few women actually take, uh, say some of the, you know, the hardware or engineering uh, kind of field. So, so that's why my segment, I sort of highlighted one of the, um, the, the actually the women, uh, Kay Thorne, who is uh, working on the, uh, the Cyrex computers with other guys. So which uh, Gillian will mention a bit more. So if you look at the, uh, the slide here. So there's a picture of um, a woman working on the star, you know, looking at the photo, uh, astro photo, which is the photos of the stars taken. And then uh, on the right hand side, you can see that this is the, uh, the star map that was being charted, um, drawn from those calculations of the map. So, you know, in Perth, Sydney, I think Brisbane as well, there is the, um, the observatory. So that's where the women sort of worked in. So if you go to the next slide, um, uh, Caroline, yep. So you can see what I mentioned about the hidden figures. I think that's one of the more sort of popular um, movies that highlights the role of women. So um, yeah, so that was the part about the you know the night sky, and then when you uh, and then I also mentioned about Kay Thorne. So you can find a picture of her in the um, in the Melbourne Museum, and that's the picture from there. And uh, she applied for the role of a TA, and that was the start. And actually, you know, uh, what she mentioned later was that what is the role of a technical assistance? It's actually doing anything and everything. So basically, you know, she and the team actually just work on, you know, work on the Cyrex computer, uh, making it, you know, um, available for others. You know, doing the number crunching and the data, um, uh, data analysis. Okay, using the computer. So yeah, so next you can see that that's the uh, the team. So this part I sort of just uh, like to highlight about, you know, about them working as a team on the computer and that time, it is actually something very exciting. And um, and because everything is, you know, unlike now where things are sort of known and, you know, established. So at the time they had to create something out of nothing in that sense. Um, and they have to do a lot of troubleshooting and working together and that's, um, you know, the, I think that's also the case currently with new emergings of technologies that you have to sort of start from somewhere and try and troubleshoot together. Because one person really, you can't, um, you, can't you can't do something great with just one person. You need a team here. Yeah. Okay, so next, we will go back to Roland. <laughs> we will continue on with the video. So I'm here with May, and uh, she's an educator with uh, ScienceWorks. When was Cyrex switched on? Well, we actually celebrated Cyrex's 70th anniversary, 70th birthday last year. So it was first switched on in 1949. 1949, 70 years ago. And, and how does it compare? Because my laptop um, is about 0.2 of a metre in yeah. area. Well, as you can see behind us, this is actually only three quarters of Cyrax. So Cyrax took up an entire room. It was a very power hungry beast. It was smelly, it was noisy. You can imagine. Well, my laptop is 65 yeah. watts of power, just about an, a light bulb. Yeah, it would, um, Cyrax would take um, the electricity that would be required to power a small town. Wow. Yeah. What, what about the, um, the weight? My laptop weighs about two kilograms. 
Um, well, as you can see behind us, Cyrac is very huge, but it actually weighs over two tonnes. And um, now the speed, I know um, mine has about uh, 2.4 billion hertz. What's the speed of this? Oh, it's only about 500 to 1,000 hertz, Roland. And the memory is about 16.4 um, billion bytes on my laptop. Now, if you can imagine, Cyrac at its time was a supercomputer, but it only had the memory of, say, a Word document around two kilobytes. I've got lots of transistors and electronic chips inside my laptop. How many in here? Well, Cyrac was pre-silicon chips, so it was around um, 2,000 valves. So hey, those are like those, those bits of glass you often see in the back of old TVs and radios, is yeah, it? Yeah, a little bit like that. They're called thermionic valves. They kind of look like a bulb. How much information is on one of those? Uh, a bit. Um, oh, a bit. <laughs> well, let's have a look inside Cyrac. Let's think about the first programmable computer. How do we get information into the computer? I mean, back then, you would have done it with wires, but actually rewiring the computer. This was reprogrammable. It meant that they needed to get information in. And they actually adapted some of the technology from the telegraph industry with um, being able to send messages on punch tape. And in fact, you can see here some of the 12 and 5 hole punch tape units that were used to put information in. It even had an editing suite, and that was a wooden box where they would simply cut and rearrange the paper. In fact, by reloading the paper, they could load new programs and new subroutines, and they could use the printout of the whole paper to actually have some sort of output. So think about the contribution of the telegraph ribbon and also the punch cards used by weavers that actually informed the technology for putting information into a computer. We now do this with a keyboard, and that's something that we've taken for granted, perhaps, where its origins came from in the world's first programmable computer. Think also about the memory. And you can see on the top of CIRAC here, and at the back, there is the long-term storage of data. We want a place to store it so we can do things. Now, memory is not the same as storage. The CIRAC memory was just 2,000 bytes, or 2K. And using acoustic memory delay lines, they were able to temporarily store information in the actual program. Now today we use RAM and ROM memory chips, but mercury delay lines, and that's using the chemical mercury, was a way of actually storing information in CIRAC and holding it in the same way that you might write a number down in maths to one side to complete your calculation. Now you also want a long-term storage of data and so they actually developed a horizontal axis disk type device and that allowed them to actually write information that could be stored, that could be accessed later. And the CIRAC storage was just 2,500 bytes or 2.5K. Again, it's about the size of a, of a page of information or a Word doc. And that was a innovative way of actually storing information. It didn't exist before. It wasn't like they went to a shop and bought it. They developed the first version of what we now know as a hard disk drive. They also had to develop an operating system as a way of actually having a high level interpreted programming language, a way of having instructions that could be followed. Um, they wrote this to help them in, in loading up new programs and solving some problems. And it was a way of actually allowing other people to make changes to programs quicker than having to program it at the machine level. And it's similar to many forms of BASIC as we know. An issue that these computers have is digital K or data rot. Now, I could take one of the CIRAC programs and run it through CIRAC, and we have that. And it's still fragile, it's a paper tape, and it needs to be physically stored. It's the same issue that we have today with digital data, because the truth is, as Bruce Sterling said, the truth is that computation has, from the very start, been built to rot. And we have a lot to learn about the problem of digital decay and data rot, and it's something that museums have to tackle with and help us come to understand how to preserve these memories and how to preserve these programs. Now, the first digital computer to play music on the 7th of August 1951 was CIRAC. And one of the songs it played was Colonel Bogey. And it was done by someone having the inspiration of connecting up a speaker. So the raw pulses of computer data actually were sent out in an audio amplifier, and we had a music playing computer. This wasn't something CIRAC came out of the box for. This is from the tinkering and the playfulness and the creativity of saying, what could I do with this computer? 
perhaps play music. It was also used to program and predict weather. And to do that forecasting, now that could be done by hand, it could be done so much faster with a computer like this. Although these computers were originally conceived of as machines for doing ballistic calculations, for following trajectories of objects, the inspiration of using it for programming com music, to program and predict the weather, or to design ways of actually doing statistics, or astronomy, or perhaps even building design, this is innovative, creative, and this is where it started. So, moving through those slides then, you'll see that I've got here the specifications, and it was a beast of a machine. Those 2,000 bytes were 2,000 valves, glass valves on the back of the machine. And moving forward, you have this paper ribbon. And as I indicated, that came from the telegraph industry. They just had the serendipity to say, there's got to be a better way to code this. Let's try this. And remember the weavers who actually had the weaving machines and the women who were involved actually using the idea of let's bring some of this craft technology into our coding environment. And this is probably as open source as you can get when you've got an open box, you could just reach into, grab and pick your own subroutine. That's the origin of open source. Good to see the box doesn't have a padlock on it. Next, you've got the memory. These are mercury delay lines. The museum's actually archived the mercury. Don't want to sort of have lashings of it around in the museum. And we've now moved to using RAM and ROM chips. But remember, memory doesn't equal storage. Next. This is your hard drive. The first, there was nothing before this, and it wasn't like that they were just waiting for it. This was their imagination at coming up with a disk type device. It's a way of actually storing 2.5K. Next, we have the operating system. And that was developed by Jeff Hill in 1960 as a way of actually having a high level interpretive programming language. And it's similar to early forms of BASIC and allows them to actually work out the input from a paper tape reader and the output to a paper tape punch. And you'll see Gillian making some reference to that paper tape punch. I'll just touch briefly here on the digital decay problem. Now, we've got the tape. Can we still use it? Well, we can't actually physically switch Cyrac on. It'll blow up in the puff of dust. So we have to use other ways of actually trying to archive and access that. And today we know the fragility of digital files is more sometimes than physical ones. And Chris Sterling made the comment that the truth is that computation has, from this very start, been built to rot. We've got a lot to learn about this problem. <laughs> Next. You saw me mentioning about playing music. And Jeff Hill had a music background. And I don't just mean he listened to the radio. They were extremely proficient in various musical instruments and understood pitch, tone. So it was natural for them to have this as a first for playing music in the world. And also for the weather and being able to do some of the really innovative ways of actually trying to do things with this technology. Gillian. Okay, just start up with uh, the video, please. Bye everyone. I'd like you to cast your minds back to post-World War II, more than 70 years ago, and consider what the, the world was like in those days. Go back to, to London. In London, you've got a lot of technology and ideas being developed, and you've got a character by the name of Trevor Piercy. He was a young guy, only about 26, 27. He applied for a job in Sydney. He was given the job, so he had to travel from London to Sydney. In those days, because of the Second World War and whatever transport they had at the time, his journey involved catching a plane to New York. He then had to travel by train across America to California, and then he had to fly from California to Sydney. And his seat wasn't in economy, it was sitting upon the mail bags. It was a, an Air Force um, aircraft of some sort. 
took ages. And that really had an impression on the young Trevor Piercy because what he was doing was spending a lot of time sitting around mulling over ideas. He had a very creative mind. And it's that mind that I just want to tap into, if I can, for a few moments, just to see where it led him. So go back a bit. He's in New York. He travels down by train to the MIT campus and he's looking at their, um, their computer, which is a mechanical adding device. It was very mechanical, it was very slow, but he learned a lot. He learned about teamwork. That had a great impression on him. And so on his train ride and his plane ride sitting on the mailbags, he had a lot of time to think. And he thought, now this mechanical machine could be so much faster if it was electronic. But gee, we need somehow to be able to store that data. How can we store that data? What does it mean to work as a team? And so he had those hours on his very long journey in which to think about these things. And it was that thinking that is absolutely crucial to who Trevor Piercy was as a man, as a technical assistant, when he arrived in Sydney on Boxing Day all those years ago to start his new life and the life that led to this. So in terms of the human side of this story, I'd like to ask a few questions. A few questions stimulated by the existence of a simple chair. The chair itself has a long and checkered and often forgotten history. We're not going to go into that now, but what I want to use the chair for is to just describe or to ask some questions. Who sat on it? What is the significance of this chair? The people. Who were these people? Why did they use this particular chair? CIRAC as we see it today, because it's in Melbourne, is called CIRAC. It actually started in Sydney under the name of Mark I. The fact that it had a one in its name tells us that the designers, creators, invented, inventors, Piercy and his team, were visionaries. They saw further computer development. Because this was not actually designed as a computer. They designed it in order to test circuitry, to test whether we can actually store data. When they designed this computer, it was pretty much looking like this in Sydney, the Mark I. It had all the valves and the gadgetry, the wires, the technical stuff was all on display because it was enclosed within the university department. Only the, the inventors and the, the immediate crew had any access to it. But once Sydney University decided that they didn't want it anymore and the University of Melbourne was going to take it over, the young gentleman, Frank Hurst, came from Melbourne. He took one look at it and thought, wow, those doors are going to have to go back on. So what you're seeing now is the Sydney version. If you were able to take the, the camera behind the, um, to the side of the display, you'd see that the back part was covered with these grey cabinet doors. And Hurst immediately knew that when we take this to Melbourne and it's open to the public to use and it'll be available 24 hours a day, we have to protect that circuitry. We have to put the doors back on. So he saw that there was an immediate user person interface that needed to be changed. It was very important. One of the uses for the for CIRAC now that it's in Melbourne was to be available to the public. So any organisation, a business, the uh, Defence Forces could come up to Melbourne, bring their data and number crunch it, for want of a better word. One of the interesting activities that they had on um, open day for the University of Melbourne was the public could take away a souvenir of the paper data roll. So we have a large roll over here that had the program on it. It was fed into the computer and would come out. Over on the other side, we've got the scraps of prior programs that they were handing out to the um, attendees at the open day. The attendees were free to walk around and then they realised that, oh, people are souveniring some of the main data roll before it's even gone into the computer. So they very quickly put up a barrier to stop people going behind the console and souveniring the program before it's even run. So hence, we have a barrier. And the barrier has been required in front of CIRAC ever since. 
So the barrier is part of its history, even though, yes, it is a, a museum exhibit and exhibits have barriers. It was to keep the people out from the people's computer because it was people not understanding what the paper was about. They knew it existed, they knew it had to go in, so they had knowledge but little understanding. And that little understanding of CIRAC has plagued its successes over the years. We go to the next uh, slide, thanks Caroline. <coughs> Excuse me. So what we've been doing is having a look at anything and everything that we can find out about um, who these people were. Who were the teams behind the invention or the design, the creation of Mark I back in Sydney, Trevor Piercy and a small group of about, I don't know, half a dozen individuals. And then CIRAC once it moved down to Melbourne. And who were the uh, maintainers? Who were the further developers? And who were the users? And we've been analysing all the descriptions of these people. What were their personalities like? What were their frustrations? And we've come up with this, um, a series of points that we think kind of describes who, who would be, um, or what are the characteristics of people who are inventors, inventors in the IT industry. So is this what we're trying to develop in our kids in school? Now, we know that they had to be intuitive, having a gut feeling, knowing that, oh, we can do this better, and then having an imagination and an understanding of the actual sciences behind the invention. Those three things are absolutely critical. But more so, you have to go into the logical expression. How do you actually convince your team members of the reality um, of designing a, a, a an artifact that would you know, do the job that you're trying to do. So how did Piercy go and convince his um, team as a junior academic that he was, that he needed this disc or a drum as they called it. So you have to have that imagination and we need to develop that in our kids. Um, what we also had to realize was that we needed to know about the, um, the social conditions at the time happened to my slide. Aren't we racing forward here? The social conditions were money was tight. You know, it was post World War II. There's a depression um, that we're still recovering from. And that really long journey that PSC made on um, planes and trains and goodness knows what else in order to get from London to Melbourne was very, very critical because when he realised he needed a component, he also realised, I have to make it here myself. It has to be made in Australia because it would take too long to get it either from the States or from London. And so they had to scrounge and, and be inventive and recycle all those different components and develop new stuff um, because it just simply wasn't feasible to order it from America. The time was critical. And without that personal understanding of how long it took him to make that journey um, and the hardship, you know, that really impacted on how good, um, good their inventiveness was. So if we go to the next slide, thanks. Ah, back to you, Roland, I think. That's it, yep. Now, I think it's actually good so let's think to ask some questions. Hold that there, thank you. Um, Gillian, would you be interested in asking some questions to the audience? Oh, um, any questions, questions. Um, for okay. Gillian, doc, Dr. Gillian Kidman? We might uh, bring yeah. this camera around. It's um, interesting to know how what their minds were thinking. Hey, Arjun, but um, you know, the first computer designed and built here in Australia. Any questions? Yes. I, I was wondering if you had any, uh, if you'd like to elaborate more on the fact that it started in Sydney and got given over to Melbourne and the different motivations why that, why that happened. 
Ah, that's a very interesting story. Um, what was happening is Trevor Pearcy was appointed as a technical assistant, which probably equates to a research assistant in today's um, terminology. So he was very, very junior and only 26 or 27. He was answerable to the heads of department, which when you look at the photos, they're probably in their late 40s, mid 50s. You know, they're going grey, they're um, elderly, middle-aged men, I guess you would call them. Also the professors, and they were interested in radio physics and radar, because it was post-World War II, that was hot, hot scientific topic. They were also interested in trying uh, to predict rainfall, because New South Wales and Queensland was in the masses of a, a huge drought, probably equivalent to today's, but it was big for way back then. And so aside from doing all of that radio physics and um, drought mitigation technical work, PC was building these computer components and coming up with Mark I, sort of in the spare time that he had whilst he was working in after hours. Once he had a, a prototype, his bosses said to him, well, predict when the, um, the drought is going to break. When are we going to get rain? And so he tried. And like a heck of a lot of other experiments and, and programs, it failed. His bosses weren't impressed and said, oh, so you can't do it. It's no good. We're not going to invest in Mark I anymore. We're going to decommission it. We'll put it open on the market. Anyone can have it. They've just got to come and take it away. So it was advertised and University of Melbourne decided they would take it. So they sent Frank Hurst up to Sydney and Frank's job was simply go up there, unplug it and bring it down, which I find is a, a good indicator they had no real understanding of what it actually was that they were getting if you could simply just unplug it. So it took him about five or six months to literally unplug it by following every single lead and cable to unplug and map it all out so that when they got it back to Melbourne, they could re-plug it in. And it took another, um, I think it was about eight or nine months in which to re-establish it once it was back in Melbourne before they could turn it on. So it was because of a failed program that the, um, the university bosses, if you like, or the department bosses in Sydney lost faith in this thing, couldn't see a, a use for it. So they decided they would get rid of it. And Melbourne Uni saw that they could use it so they adopted it. And in the process, it went from being known Mark I through to CIRAC. So that's the story of it. Um, there was very little interest in it because very few people actually knew it existed in Sydney and knew what it was all on about. So it, had a, it was like a, the quiet achiever there. And that came down to Melbourne, unless you went to open day um, or you were one of a few people who had a use for it, again, it was a little bit of an obscure piece of technology that nobody really knew existed um, or how powerful it could actually be. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a, an insight into the unloved nature of Mark I through to CIRAC. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Dr Gillian? Yep. Yes, it's just a general question about computer history. And I'd just like to firstly thank you guys for looking after this. Um, have great memories of CIRAC when I first came to LinuxConf in Melbourne in 2008. That was awesome. Uh, so I grew up in the 80s, um, you know, with home computers, but I also had a real appreciation for the old computers when I went to work for IBM, and I think that kind of stayed with me. The kids of today, I don't know if they have the same appreciation for the old computers and computer history. And I'm just wondering what sort of things are happening in that space, you know, when our kids are just so spoilt now with all that tech that they have that they don't get to, I guess, see and appreciate where it came from. Um, I'm not quite sure of your question. It was breaking up a little bit. But does Sorry. it relate to um, kids of today appreciating... Computer history. Sorry. Sorry, um, just about kids of today appreciating computer history. I just feel like sometimes they don't have the same appreciation of people of oh, yes. our generation yeah. who grew up with you know, home computers. Um, when we were making this video, we 
we've made a couple of visits to um, Science Works, who've been most accommodating, and thank you very much to them. Um, when we were there, the general public was also there, so we're sort of filming and, and getting our background research done at the same time as the uh, public. And on one one visit, I noticed this father came in, um, youngish guy, maybe in his early 30s at the most, and he had a little boy of about five or six. And I think the little boy must have got a ad for Christmas because the dad said to him, oh, look, um, here's this big old computer. You know your iPad? And the kitty said, yeah. And he said, well, this is about what it, where it came from. This was about the same as your iPad. And the kid's mouth literally dropped open and he said, oh, it was just this look of awe and wonder that, yes, I've, I've got this new iPad, but wow, it's, it's come from this great big ugly light flashing thing. So he was actually amazed. Um, and I thought that's good of the father trying to build that, you know, old computer into knowledge into what the, the child's got at home. On an, another visit, um, there was a, a father there who came in with maybe a girl about 10 and a boy of about three, I guess. Um, and he came up to them, or up to Cyrac with them, and he said, see this? It's about a thousand times more powerful than your iPad. <laughs> and the kids just sort of looked with this blank look of, oh, dad, boring. <laughs> so, you know, I think parents themselves are doing what they can with what knowledge they have got. Perhaps we need a sign on front of Cyrax saying, you know, it's not a thousand times bigger, so it's not a thousand times more powerful. Um, so this is something that the uh, museum is aware of, and they are wanting, um, you know, a higher profile in the classroom of Cyrax. And that was part of the um, story that Caroline started to um, today's talk about, where it was a focus. Cyrax was a focus of her pre-service teacher education. So she spent six months studying CIRAC and putting an educational spin on, on using CIRAC as it is um, in the classroom. And she'll tell you about that um, in a little while. So, you know, kids do need to know, I think, um, of the antiquated nature of, of a lot of our computing, but they need to know it in the context of what they already know and understand. So it's standard educational practice. Build on what they have. Build on what knowledge they know of. So do it in relation to today's technology, not in isolation. That's a lovely segue. Thank you, Gillian, because it begins to unpack with that inquiry. They were asking oh, yeah. questions too then, weren't they? And yeah. we don't have a monopoly on thinking, rational thought, imagination and inquiry. And that was very much happening with uh, Piercy and his team there. Now, Caroline, if you just play this video, about what actually inspired these people who were the pioneers who actually helped bring CIRAC to fruition. And look at the cultural and the personal factors that actually helped them drive change. And for me, what actually inspired them to do something more? Well, they were crafting a new culture. And we would now know this as a maker culture. And the maker culture is a technology-based extension of the do-it-yourself culture. And we can see the various things that they did themselves here, building the um, input, the storage and some of the subroutines in the operating system. And the maker culture intersects with the hacker culture. And the hacker culture includes a focus on software. The thing about a maker culture is it revels in creating new devices and tinkering of existing ones. And we think that the maker culture is a new invention. In fact, if we look back in history, we can see the evidence of this kind of innovation being driven by people that want to tinker, create. And that often happens when you've got an inquiring mind that actually asks questions about what you're doing and why and where. And often a reason, uh, maybe a love of music that wants to make a machine that plays it, or perhaps solving a tenaciously difficult problem, predicting weather. So what are the lessons for open education? Well, we want to challenge and explore, build, question and create and connect our students. And we can do that in two ways. We can make room in the curriculum, but we also need to make room in the physical spaces of our buildings. So that may be making free maker spaces that are driven by an inquiry about the 
authentic outside world and some real problems. We would like to think of students as doing the same thing as we see with CIRAC, tinkering, remashing, and inventing by exploring. And we can do that with the hard fun of coding and playing with the hardware. But we also need to have access to some of the free and open software, or perhaps even also the free and open lessons that we might learn from an open education environment that shares the learning that might be happening the way that these CIRAC pioneers were sharing the things that they had done to us. So, let's have a look at the next slide. If you could just speak up, please, Roland. Yep. We're crafting a new culture here. And we don't have a monopoly on the idea of uh, make a culture or hack a culture. This is actually going right back 70 years ago. Um, I'm actually not that happy about the diagram now, but <laughs> I'll go with it for now. Um, we can see the intersection here. Um, make a culture, technology-based extension of the do-it-yourself culture, intersecting with the hacker culture with a focus on software, and the excitement that PFC and his team had in actually creating a new device and tinkering with an existing one. And then what kind of conditions did we actually have that actually inspired that? We'll move on to the next slide. You see, there are some really big lessons for open education here. If we want to actually create conditions in the classroom we need to make the room, and that's not just the physical room, it's also the curriculum room, the room to have fun, to engage in inquiry, to challenge, build, question, connect and create, and actually have an access to that room that allows that free exploration that's not shackled by the curriculum, but catapulted by it. We'd like to imagine where you can actually tinker, remash, invent, explore the hard hardware and explore the coding and what Seymour Papert called hard fun and then actually to do that looking at free and open software like Linux hardware like the Arduino microbit and these are lessons for us because the same kind of situation that students find themselves in school are similar to what PSC and his team had and I think that can inform the kind of place and space that we want to have in the classroom now I was blessed today by actually getting a uh, quote, um, and this is from um, Guido van Rossum, who was actually the developer of Linux. Now, he had wrote a blog post on Gorni's Dach, and uh, you can explain what that is. Arjun, I think he was asking you, could you explain, um, what was it, Roland, can you repeat? Uh, Gorni's Dach. Oh, something in Dutch. I didn't quite Kings catch Day. that, Roland. By the way, Kings Peter Day. von Rossum yeah. developed he Python, not Linux. And this was at the last King's Day. Um, and the, the speech he wrote was that, in reality, programming languages are how programmers express and communicate ideas. And the audience are other programmers, not computers. It's people. And computers are people. And I think that's a really lovely connection there. And he also describes the tinkering and the playful environment where he had room to create, build and access and tinker and remesh and invent and hack and actually inspiring him and helping him build the Linux coding language. Let's look at the next slide. We took the journey from the right to the left from looking at the hardware and drilling back, I want you to take the journey from the left to the right and actually start to see the community as people and the authenticity of the tinkering and the creativity and the hard fun from these research assistants who would be as old as Caroline and the other younger members of the audience who were able to have the room and the space to create and to build and to remash and moving that forward. It's not just about the technology driving forward as much as it is about the culture. And this is some of the important work that Gillian and Hazel are doing, where they're trying to reimagine STEM as not just another piece of gadget or technology, but having some really deep, all-embracing interdisciplinary and integrated connections with culture, community, and people, and learning. Next slide.
we don't have the answers and CIRAC doesn't have the answers. And in some ways, if we face off the technology and the gadgets, we miss the human story. We start to sort of revel in the um, primitive nature of the technology without actually maybe celebrating what it was about these champions and what it is that they did that actually allowed them to have the serendipity to do the wonderful things that they made. I'll play the first uh, two minutes of this one. That one's not playing, Roland. That's okay. We can skip it over. It basically just uh, gives another run through from the CIREC system, but um, I'm just conscious of the time here and Gillian has to actually move on. So just move on to the thank you. Oh, it's playing now. Do you want to still go ahead? All right. This is the world's very first computer that was used for writing chip tunes. And you can see here on the left hand side, the open source nation of CIREC sharing programs, being able to express it. The hacking of the telegraph systems for putting information into and out. Remember, there wasn't anything before this. This came out of the imagination of a group of research assistants who were allowed to have some hard fun with a computer. And imagine if someone had given them a project management plan and uh, killed that by saying, well, by week three, we should be doing this. And in week four, we can do ballistic calculations and had railroaded them into something that we haven't actually inherited. Okay. Let's have a look now at the, uh, thank you. This is a computer that you can still actually visit and see, and it's in Melbourne. So ScienceWorks is part of Museums Victoria, which are the custodians for the state collection. Uh, and what we do here around technology and innovation is really we showcase objects that mark moments where innovation really changed society. CIRAC is a great example of that. Um, it's an amazing piece of technology, but it's also a moment that changed uh, Melbourne's culture, it changed Australian society, it changed the world. So we try to highlight those stories of how we have changed as people through innovation and what these stories are. And then as we come up to the present day, we do the same with the research we're looking at at the moment. So we will highlight Australia's advancements in quantum computing. And then what we ask of our visitors is two things. One, uh, we ask them to imagine where these things will take us in the future. What is the world you can imagine when quantum computing becomes reality? But also, we want to empower people with the skills and knowledge they need to take charge of their own lives and create their own future. Absolutely. So we'd like to welcome you to come to ScienceWorks and see CIRAC for yourself um, and engage in all these amazing experiences here. Uh, and one of the ways that we um, inspire people is through the education programs here at ScienceWorks. Um, when every student comes to ScienceWorks, we want them leaving thinking that they love science and technology, they had fun doing science te and technology, and that they can do science and technology. Uh, we want these uh, students and teachers to leave feeling empowered, um, like that they are not just consuming digital technologies, but also have a piece in creating the technology. My name is Roland Guesthausen, and on behalf of Monash University Faculty of Education, Associate Professor Gillian Kidman, Dr. Hazel Tan, thank you. Thank you. Um, any final questions for Roland or any of the team? Thank you, that was very interesting um, to, yeah, we've got one question. Uh, since we have some time, did you want to talk a little bit more about the chair? The chair, Roland, this is your, <laughs> your thing, the orange chair? Uh, the orange chair. Um, I've got a name for that orange chair. It was a particular fashionable 1940s um, aluminium leather orange chair. Um, the story was that uh, they couldn't find the chair and they wanted to try and find a mock-up. And they were asking around if anyone had something that looked around and they actually were able to uh, dig it up. I believe one chap, this is an apocryphal story, uh, who worked at the museum said, oh, I've got a chair just like that in my garage. And it was only much later they found out that it was actually the CIRAC chair that they were throwing out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it happened to salvage it and sort of drag it begrudgingly back into work. 
Um, we did actually manage to find, I think, Gillian, didn't we, a couple of chairs. We were going to come on stage there and actually bring a chair and put one on the stage there. We found one. Yeah. So if anybody Fire's wants to... Fire's put in our way. Yeah. If you want to buy it, by the way, um, it's still on Sorry. eBay, and it's, I believe it's about um, $8. Um, it's orange. <laughs> And if you send me an email, I'll send you the link. You can buy yourself a Cyrac lookalike chair and you can rock around on it. Yeah. But that, that chair is an interesting one, which is uh, what we sort of threw it in with a few, you know, chair questions. It was the, this, the very chair that um, Piercy and his team were using in the lab when they um, created and designed and then later got Mark I up and running. Um, but a little bit more on, on Piercy, if I could just have um, a few moments to indulge on one of his little, a little quirky story about it. Um, he was about to start his PhD, but World War II got in the way back in London, so he never got it. He had to join the RAF and do whatever they did with radars and things like that. Um, but Piercy was an avid writer and he wrote thousands of articles and papers and technical reports whilst sitting on that very chair. And at some stage, um, he moved from Sydney to Melbourne and he eventually became a dean at Monash University. Um, but whilst he was in Melbourne, I think at the Institute of Technology or something, um, he was given a PhD from the University of Melbourne to recognise the, the plethora of writings and his contributions to um, ICTs and that kind of thing. But simultaneously, that CIRAC was being um, used and um, functioning at the University of Melbourne. Just down the hallway, there was another research team and they were inventing the Xerox machine or what we call today the photocopier. When they had it up and running, they needed something to test. So down the corridor was carried the, I think it's about 10,000 pages. I don't know, it's absolutely huge and thick. The PhD thesis of all the publications that PSC wrote and it was copied. Those copies are still in existence at the University of Melbourne. And that's how they tested the uh, modern day photocopier by photocopying the thesis that was, um, written, you know, and published about the design of CIRAC. And just before I have to run, I have a, a question for the audience based on where you are now on the Gold Coast. A couple of questions. Um, is anybody in the audience approximately my age, in their 50s, who knows the Gold Coast from their childhood and the Surface Paradise Beer Garden? Is anybody there? If you could just give a wave. Anyone who knows of the old Surface Paradise Beer Garden from the 70s and the 80s? Oh, the old uh, Surface uh, Paradise Beer Garden from the 70s and 80s. Everybody's shaking their heads. <laughs> oh, there are a what bunch of mean? young people, are they? <laughs> Out of town. But maybe Many some of, of them are, are not imports, from I'm here. <laughs> What's right. that, Arjun? That's fine. If Many of us are imports, I'm afraid. If you were in your, you know, around um, as a child in the 60s, 70s or 80s on the Gold Coast, no doubt you would have gone to Cavill Avenue. You can go there tonight because that's still there. And you would have gone to the Surface Paradise Beer Garden. It was part of the Chevron Hotel chain. CIRAC actually did the engineering calculations for that building so that it could be one of the initial high rises um, on the Gold Coast. Unfortunately, they took it down in 1988 and opened up or did, redeveloped it and opened up the new Chevron Hotel on Cavill Avenue. So if you've got some time, not skipping any sessions at this conference, oh. after, uh, go down to Cavill Avenue, have a look at the Chevron Hotel. On that site is the original Chevron Hotel and Beer Garden. Mm, that's interesting to know. So Cavill Avenue is one of the main streets on Surface Paradise, yeah? yeah? Yep. Anyone from Sydney? Anyone from Sydney, yes. Yep, okay. We've got if some Sydney cars. Martin Place and the Reserve Bank of Australia. Yep. High rise building. Again, the engineering for that building was done on CIRAC. Still standing today. And what you've got is a, a, a snowy mountain scheme, a la CIRAC, or Mark I in those days. It was a Mark I um, thing. But 
The point I'm making is that you've got all these Australian landmarks that the engineering was done on CIRAC or Mark I. You've got um, the Reserve Bank in Sydney. It's actually heritage listed. And when you go through all the archives of the files of that building, it goes and gives you all the names of the person who upholstered the chairs that are in this drawing room and this board room. Phenomenal amount of um, data on it, but it doesn't list CIRAC. The Surface Paradise Beer Garden Chevron Hotel doesn't list CIRAC. None of the big buildings that CIRAC is responsible for actually list it as being a significant um, contributor. You've got to go through the archives and a chap called Peter Thorne, who is the husband of Kay Thorne that Hazel was uh, referring to, and his memory, and he kept a log of all of the different people that came in after hours and on the weekend when he was running the CIRAC lab um, and of all the projects. And it's in that log that you will see that these major landmarks um, actually were designed using CIRAC. So it's again another example of how the, um, it's a quiet achiever, you know, get the, uh, the recognition that it should. I just, a delicious irony just occurred to me, Gillian. Yeah. Um, we have CIRAC, a computer at one stage that was rejected as a tool for forecasting the weather and actually yep. became the world first computer in Melbourne when they successfully used it for forecasting the weather. Mm -hmm. And here we are, we're actually pinned down because of a bushfire because yeah. we, uh, Sydney politicians have not accepted the power of technology to actually accurately predict and forecast the weather, causing the, you know, this is my smoke-filled backyard here from the, the smoke that's blowing down from New South Wales. Um, we have a very orange glow to the sky some uh, kilometres away. Wouldn't it be lovely if um, that we actually had not just our uh, tinkerers and inventors, but also our politicians that actually recognised the power of technology to actually forecast, predict weather change and actually um, do good. In other words... Well, they weren't visionaries. Not everyone's a visionary. It's, it's visionary, isn't it? <laughs> I'll, I'll put my, I'll put <laughs> my more, hand in the basket. One more anti-visionary anecdote from me, and then I will have to um, be quiet so everyone else gets a chance. But the um, you mentioned that the first bit of digital music came out of... CIRAC, it did, it sounded like a bassoon. Yep. Um, it was a warning that your program was at a certain stage or about to finish. When um, Jeff Hill made that sound, he got very excited. They saw the implications for it. So they showed their CIRAC bosses here in Melbourne who said, ah, oh, we don't need that, it's frivolous. But did you know the origins of digital music is frivolous? Okay. I'm going to go. It was lovely chatting to and with um, all of you. And thank you very much for your questions. Um, if anyone else can wants to have a question, um, write it down, send it out, and we can respond to um, A and, and get it back to you if I'm not around. That's later. right. If, if you can share your email address with uh, Caroline, we'd be more than love to just talk a bit more about it and even keep you up to date with some of the developments that we're doing in the education space, isn't it, Gillian? With yep. the new group that we're forming and some of those changes, just pass on your email address to Caroline. And I'm sure Thank that you um, your, your email addresses will be published at some point. Yep. So thank you so much for um, yeah, tuning in. And um, yeah, we'll have to say goodbye. Let's wrap up from here. Thank you. Okay, I, know, I know that we actually got the applause here. Caroline and I have worked really hard to actually pull this off together with the museum staff. Could the audience please show the appreciation to Caroline and Ayan for driving the school? <laughs> Thank you to the uh, Museum and Science Works. Sorry, Gillian? A big thank you to the Museum and Science Works here in Melbourne. Yes. That's yes, right. Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. See you later. Yep. We'll talk later. Okay. Cool. Oh, Hazel, did you want to say anything? Or? <coughs> oh, no, it's just the last note that, you know, to challenge the audience because uh, some of you might be educators or you might have uh, children you know, um, to sort of bring more awareness towards like the history of things and, and to link it, you know, um, to, for example, the CIRAC as well. So how do you promote, you know, coming back to like promoting females in, in computer and, you know, in the IT industry? 
Great. So and to make things aware. So I think that's for me that's sort of like you know the challenge for you to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll be around for the rest of the day. I can also ex um, chat about my experiences working on the CIREC project as well. So thank you, everyone, for today. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.